pass out cards, so we have plenty of opportunity to ask questions. Julie Henderson is a sophomore and a graphics design major at the University of San Francisco, and she's a member of the Queer Alliance Gender Roots Organization. The Queer Alliance um, seeks to raise awareness and uh, eliminate discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation, as well as focusing on political issues. Uh, the club also serves as a social safe space for gay and lesbian, transgender, queer students. Julie? Everybody can hear me. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, and thank you to everyone who showed up. I didn't anticipate this many people. This is excellent. This is actually, if you could just give a round of applause to the LGBTQ Caucus of USF for putting this together. And uh, Reverend Allison, it is awesome to have you come all this way to San Francisco to speak with us today. Personally, it's an absolute honor to be here speaking with all of you in this community and conversation project as a representative of the queer student body of USF. We're here today addressing what has already been outlined as a tough question to answer, and I feel that Reverend Allison has provided us with a very hopeful and optimistic outlook for gay Catholics. I wanted to start by quoting something that stood out to me particularly in his, uh, in his speech, which is that, only as we learn to love our neighbors as ourselves do we find out who we really are. This claim, I feel, speaks best to the framework of thought that I'm going to use to respond to what Reverend Allison has said in his speech. And I believe it encompasses the virtues of acceptance, humility, uh, love, and mercy, which most clearly present the angle from which we need to approach this, approach this very serious issue of ethics and ethical behavior in the Catholic Church. Now you mentioned that your fears of uh, becoming Catholic and being confirmed into the Catholic faith mostly rested in and were deeply rooted in your feelings that you would become part of something evil. Um, after receiving about nine years of Catholic school education by the time I was 14, which was the same year that I was confirmed into the Catholic Church, my fears did not rest so much in the thought of being evil. Rather, my one deep concern as a young woman was the manner in which the Catholic Church really had an interesting way of demonstrating the significance of women and the role that we play, whether it be in the last 2,000 years of recorded human history or in the present day. It is important to note that as early as July of 2004, the Vatican distributed a pamphlet in which it condemned the modern feminist movement and its apparent influence on making homosexuality more culturally acceptable. This pamphlet, titled On the Celebration of Men and Women in the World and in the Church, was actually written by then Cardinal Ratzinger, who argued, and I quote, that proponents of feminism call into question the family in its natural, two-parent structure of mother and father, and make homosexuality and heterosexuality virtually equivalent in a new model of polymorphous sexuality. It is also very, very clearly stated that this feminist ideology, and anything other than a sanctimonious commitment of love between a man and a woman, will negatively impact global society. With that said, it is very difficult for me to be so enthusiastic about the current leadership, and just as difficult to be optimistic about the rate at which we are progressing in the Catholic Church. I'm going to move on, but I'll return to same-sex versus heterosexual marriage in the, in the end. Now, the Catholic education that I received was perhaps abnormally ethics-obsessed, given that you experienced one in which Catholicism and ethics were more detached. The primary focus in my education was, in fact, on understanding the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, pure and evil. In my transition from my Catholic elementary school to my Benedictine Catholic high school, I maintained this acquired knowledge of Catholic definitions of right and wrong, and to some extent I was able to discuss them with some degree of expertise in group discussion and in papers. I see a solid relationship there between Catholicism and ethics as my experience rarely, if ever, separated the two. I still, to this very moment, despite how much my interactions with the Catholic faith have changed, hold firm the belief 
that Catholicism is a collection of guidelines by which we lead a more satisfying and virtuous life, that it provides us with a sense of good and bad, and that it gives us the power to do what is right versus what is wrong. My religion teachers, particularly in elementary school, stressed the importance of the Pope's supreme power. It wasn't until recently that I allowed myself to truly investigate just how destructive and detractory that power could become if used inappropriately. But before then, it was my understanding that the, matter, that the manner in which the Pope interpreted God's word was to be accepted as divine truth without exception. As a result, this just there quality that you introduce and suggest as being a calming source of relief that allows us to be far more relaxed about popes, bishops, theologians, etc., is somewhat ineffective in my case. As a lesbian and a feminist, it is a challenge to relax in the midst, to relax in the midst of a pope who believes so strongly that my presence is negatively impacting the world around me. What increases my anxiety is the fact that I am one of many young adults who received a Catholic education which assures you that whatever the Pope says goes. While many of us in this room know that I cannot, in the eyes of God, be an abomination given that I was created in God's image, there are many out there who actually feel that that is the truth. And why shouldn't they? Just like me, they were told that what the Pope says goes. I would argue that the men that we have placed in positions of leadership in the church, that is, the men who have the power to help the church evolve and progress with new interpretations of God's word, are most entirely responsible for getting it right. It is their words and actions that are taken for truth by the majority of the members of the Catholic community. Certainly these words and actions are governed by the guidance they believe is given to them by God, but ultimately they are the ones who publish pamphlets and encyclicals including the rights and wrongs of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Reverend Allison, you suggest that less responsibility belongs to our popes, bishops, and theologians, that the work is being done by someone else, that we need not worry, that everything will ultimately change for the better and ultimately work out in the end. As an activist, it is very difficult for me to comprehend that someone else is really doing all of the work and getting it all right. It is even more challenging to accept that we are only responsible for small contributions along the way because there will always be someone else there to take care of this business. I maintain that we are far more responsible for the changes made in our environments than we take credit for and to believe that this just there or someone else is taking care of it is irresponsible on our part as we represent a new wave of reform in the Catholic Church. Furthermore, if it, is a Catholic, if it is a collective belief that we are here on earth simply representing someone else's show, then why must our leaders in the community impart their subjective interpretations of exactly who gets treated with respect and who, in turn, is ostracized by the community at large? If the most we can really do is to be more or less appropriate in our response, then we are not living up to this challenge. It is our responsibility as members and as allies of the LGBTQ community to continue to develop and receive full-heartedness love for each other, as you mentioned. However, it is not our responsibility to show how our love is worthy of as much attention and credibility as would exist between a man and a woman. The goal should not be to explore the differences and similar similarities between these sexualities, but rather to remove the terms hetero and homo from our language and replace them both with one word, human. In doing so, there is no question about who exactly acknowledges love and commitment as gifts from and access to God, because the truth that all love is a gift would be unanimously accepted. <laughs>